Welcome to STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. Welcome to STEM Talk, where we introduce you to fascinating people who passionately inhabit the scientific and technical frontiers of our society. Hi, I'm your host, Don Carnegas, and joining me to introduce today's podcast is a man behind the curtain, Dr. Ken Ford, IHMC's director and chairman of the Double Secret Selection Committee that selects all the guests who appear on STEM Talk. Hello, Don. Great to be here. Today we have Dr. Barbara Thorne, a termite biologist and an expert on the conehead species, a South and Central American termite that has invaded South Florida and requires immense efforts to contain and eradicate. So Barbara is a research professor and professor emerita in the Department of Entomology at the University of Maryland. Since 2012, she served as a science advisor for the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services Conehead Termite Program. And she's also chairs the National Scientific Advisory Committee for the Conehead Termite Program. So her research focuses on the biology of termites, which are highly social insects that form complex colony structures. And Barbara earned her PhD in organismic and evolutionary biology in 1983 from Harvard University, where she studied with the renowned Dr. E.O. Wilson, who's a biologist and naturalist who is recognized as the world's leading authority on ants, sociobiology, and many other things. Before we get to our interview with Barbara, we have some housekeeping to take care of. First, we really appreciate all of you who have subscribed to STEM Talk, and we are especially appreciative of all the wonderful five-star reviews. As always, the Double Secret Selection Committee has been continually and carefully reviewing iTunes, Google, Stitcher, and other podcast apps for the wittiest and most lavishly praise-filled reviews to read on STEM Talk. If you hear your review read on STEM Talk, just contact us at stemtalk at ihmc.us to claim your official STEM Talk t-shirt. Today, our winning review was posted by someone who goes by the moniker Vox Romana. The review is titled, Of Ketones and Philosopher Kings. What a great title. That's a great title. The review (laughs) reads, This robust library of podcasts produced by Ken and Don is a tremendous trove of wisdom, inspiration, and knowledge. Within each interview, listeners are granted a unique glimpse into some of the most brilliant minds in science and, by extension, the inner workings of the universe and its marvels and mysteries. I particularly enjoy hearing guests speak about what led them to careers in science, as well as the practical and innovative information offered to help us all live healthier and more resilient lives. Thank you, Ken, Don, and IHMC. Well, thank you so much, Vox Romana, and thanks to all of our other STEM Talk listeners who helped STEM Talk become such a great success. Okay, and now on to today's interview with Dr. Barbara Thorne. STEM Talk. 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 Hi, welcome to STEM Talk. I'm your host, Don Carnegas, and joining us today is Barbara Thorne. Barbara, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. And also joining us is Ken Ford. Hello, Don, and hello, Barbara. So, Barbara, you grew up in the San Fernando Valley of Southern California. So the question is, were you a valley girl? (laughs) That's uh, absolutely correct. Or should I say totally? (laughs) Yes. I was born and raised in the San Fernando Valley. Very happy growing up in the 60s and early 70s. Lots of friends. Great music. Spent loads of time outside. So I'm not sure I fit the stereotype of a valley girl, but definitely I was part of the mix. Yeah. So I understand that it was uh, Wanderlust that sent you from the West Coast to the East Coast for college after you graduated from high school. So why did you decide on Brown University for college? Well, surprisingly, given my career track, I was not interested in science at all in high school or earlier. And so one thing that really attracted me to Brown was it was one of the very few schools at the time that did not have a core curriculum or broad distribution requirements. So I thought, oh, I, I think I'll try and go there where I won't have to take science. Wow. Uh, what, what changed your mind? So it was actually wonderful. They did a very clever thing at Brown. They didn't force you to do anything, but they made it very clear during freshman week before we signed up for classes, the advantages of a broad education. And they sold it very authentically. They said, you're not required, but we strongly encourage you to become well-educated people by exploring a wide range of courses. And the other kind of genius thing they did, and other schools do this too, and I love it, is your first year, you have the option to take interdisciplinary seminars. And I took two that were science-oriented, 
because I, I did buy into their idea of, you know, explore. This is the time to explore. So I took a course on the changing of the seasons, which in California were summarized as green, brown, and browner. But here <laughs> I was in New England and fall semester, these spectacular colors coming up with all the trees. And so it was a great topic. And then the next semester, I took an even far more reaching one, which was also fantastic, Earth, Moon, and Mars. So instead of these like broad survey courses that are ex expose you to a lot of a topic, say for biology or chemistry or physics or economics or really anything, I like this idea to interest students in really any area. You know, let them dive into a topic even as freshmen. That's something pretty interesting. So, you know, a course on for students interested in health sciences, say the physiology of exercise or the neurobiology of sleep or dreaming or human genetics or something that kind of lets them get a hook on the field they think they're interested in. And I feel the same way for students interested in law or business or art or whatever. Just like that's just such a pleasure to sort of get a grip on a topic in detail as opposed to the, the broad survey course where you're in with a couple of hundred students. So for me, it was wonderful. These were great springboard courses for my interests, and I kind of saw how you could think in a very analytical, scientific, query, curiosity-driven way, and I just decided that way of thinking was very satisfying for me and that way to learn. So actually, I, I never looked back. I switched immediately to science, and I'm so happy I did. Hmm. That's really cool. I will tell you, my classes were um, evolutionary biology and chemical oceanography that I took as an undergrad that you know allowed me to really kind of delve into some topics that were really fascinating to me. So I agree with what you said. That's, that's awesome that you got that experience. Oh, that's wonderful. Yes. So on, on that note, some kids grow up liking bugs. And I know I also did <laughs> growing up because I wanted to be every type of scientist when I was a kid. But you were not one of them. And, and because you're a valley girl, after all. So what triggered your interest in bugs in the first place? Uh, that's so true. Yes, I never, never even thought about bugs as a young sprout, never ran around with a butterfly net. <laughs> and so the, my choice to explore bugs was actually purely pragmatic. And it was after I did this lane change after my freshman year of college and decided to go into biology. And I was thinking, I, I, you know, there's lots of diversity of bugs. They're in the tropics and temperate zones. There's lots of topics, lots of applications. They're hugely important to ecosystems. And then uh, kind of just like on the practical side, they're very tractable with, you can do experiments with them and they have a short generation time so they can be reared in the lab. And I, I was very interested in genetics, which was just blossoming at the time. And, and of course, fruit flies were front and center in that whole arena. So anyway, I decided I, I need to explore bugs. So we understand it was Bug Camp and E.O. Wilson's book, The Insect Societies, at, that at least partially motivated you to attend Harvard. Could you tell us about that? So at Brown, they did not offer a course in entomology, which was fairly typical. It still is. The, you don't really have as many taxon-oriented courses, a whole course on birds, a whole course on mammals, a whole course on bugs. And, uh, and they didn't. But a wonderful professor at Brown recommended that I go for a summer course. The University of Michigan had a bio still has a biological station in northern Michigan which is affectionately called Bug Camp, even though it offered and, and still does a wide range of biological topics from fungi to ornithology to botany to limnology. I, I don't know what all. But anyway, it was wonderful. And I went in the summer of 1974, and that was my first and only entomology course. And because you're perched out in the field, everything that you study is, is from the field. And so it was just a terrific experience. I loved the atmosphere. It was a relatively isolated place, a remote perch on a very serene lake, and you're immersed with other students and faculty who are very excited about what everything they're doing, and, and you're there. Like, it's not a commuter kind of place where you just take a class. Everybody was living there. So it was lots of fun, lots of discussions. I learned a ton. And the first day I was there, of course, I didn't know anyone. I was just kind of wandering around, and there was this little cabin that turned out to be the library. So I went in there, and right in the front, they had a, a small little shelf that was labeled with a cardboard sign saying, New Books. And right on that, I noticed this book titled The Insect Societies. 
by Edward O. Wilson. And actually, that was published in 1971. Here it was 1974, and it was featured on the new bookshelf. But I uh, was immediately attracted to it, and I checked it out. And I didn't even look at any other books in the library. I read that one and reread it all summer. And I became completely fascinated by social insects, their biology, their abundance, their importance, theories about how they evolved. And and then it, it also became clear to me reading that book that of all the social insects, termites were very understudied and quite different out of the box. So they particularly captured my attention. So for listeners who aren't familiar with Wilson, he's an American biologist, naturalist, environmental activist who is recognized as the world's leading authority on on many things, actually, from, from ants to sociobiology. And he spent 40 years on the Harvard faculty and authored more than 30 books, including two that won Pulitzer Prizes. So how did Wilson, um, who just passed away over a year ago, become your PhD faculty advisor? What an incredible opportunity. Oh, I, I always, forever in my life, it just... I, was an incredible privilege and one of the most fortunate, influential things that ever happened to me. And so when I was applying to graduate schools and still pretty interested in social insects, I applied to Harvard as an immense reach, certainly from the the Insect Society's book. And somehow I landed an interview. Of course, I saw myself as kind of a cheap interview. Here I am in Providence, Rhode Island. And it's just a, a one-hour bus ride, which is what I was offered up to Boston, but I grabbed it. And shortly after I arrived for, it was just a few hour block of time they wanted you to come for the interview. They they did this unexpected agenda reveal that I was expected to give a 10 minute chalk talk to three faculty members, which was incredibly intimidating for a senior in college to, to speak to three Harvard faculty members. But I had this whole interview I looked at as a kind of life adventure mindset of, hey, this is a long shot, but why not? You know, just give it a shot. So I was determined to do my best. And what I spoke about was my senior thesis, which it was only fall of my senior year, so I really haven't hadn't done too much on it. But my big goal was to do this, and this is going to date me, but this was the truth. I, I was just learning computer programming, and I had these big boxes of the punch cards that went into the computer that kind of gave it gave the program. And I was trying to simulate a um, basic genetics thing that did have some relevance to social insects. Anyway, I presented that as clearly as I could, figuring I had nothing to lose in this impromptu mini-seminar. And it turned out that one of the three faculty members was Ed Wilson, who I recognized from the, his picture on the back of the book. And I already had so much respect for him. So it just made my day to meet him. And then when I got there, because I, I, when I was accepted, I decided, well, I hadn't really planned on this, but I'm, I'm going to you know, go because it was just too great an opportunity to pass up. So when I talked to him about becoming his student, he was pretty direct, said, I expect a lot of independence and initiative. And um, he wanted me to be self-driven. He, w- he would have very high standards. And if it didn't work out, I, I would be sent to, to find a different advisor. He made that clear. Uh, he wanted me to have my own project, my own funding. But as it turned out, we just got along really well. And I learned, you know, it was, it was a very good mesh of personalities. And, you know, everything was just, again, I consider it so fortunate. Mm. E.O. Wilson spent quite a bit of his childhood, as you might know, in Pensacola and some of the neighboring towns around here. In fact, it was very near here where the seven-year-old young Wilson severely damaged his right eye in a fishing accident when a pinfish struck his eye. Yeah, that was very influential for him. Um, But all that time outside, he was an authentic, just field naturalist. He was so happy out in the field, I know, as a kid and and even later in life. His parents had a second floor apartment, sort of really close to downtown, uh, like a a walk down the hill into downtown. And I've read stories about him walking through looking for ants, and uh, particularly a story about a lion ant. It's an amazing That's guy. Great. Now, I understand that you have referred to this period when you were at Harvard and probably shortly thereafter as the golden age for research into social insects. Could you tell us a little about that? When I arrived in the fall of 1976, Ed was very well known across social insect circles, but his rather meteoric rise to fame on the broader biology scene was really just beginning. And 
I got to, to witness that transition. Also at Harvard at the time was Bert Holdobler, another incredibly amazing and accomplished ant biologist who often collaborated with Ed, including they, they wrote a masterful treatise work called The Ants, for which they won a Pulitzer Prize. And Ed and Bert shared the entire floor of a building roughly splitting the space along a a central hallway with Ed's labs and library and offices on one side and Bert's on the other. But there was lots of flow and shared spaces. And basically, we all viewed ourselves, meaning the faculty and and everyone who worked there, the staff, the students, the postdocs, as one big lively hive, so to speak, if you'll forgive the analogy. And Ed and Bert were magnets for lots of visitors from all over the world, mostly working on ants and bees and wasps. There was me with the termites. I was the only one. But it was basically immersion and incubation in in an epicenter of social insect biology discourse with lots of discussion of of the insects themselves, their eusocial evolution. W.D. Hamilton was a visiting scientist during that time and his landmark papers to explain the evolution of altruism. People were practically doing victory laps of, okay, we've solved that this conundrum of how did eusocial or highly social insects evolve. I think we'll talk more about that later in this interview. But he was there and other short-term and long-term guests who all presented seminars and often early previews of their unpublished ideas and results. And so for us who were the students there, which was a remarkable peer group, just students, postdocs, and of course, we learned so much from each other. Everybody super excited and working hard on different aspects of social insect biology and theory, lots of informal gatherings to float our half-baked ideas to each other and You could count on unfiltered comments and reactions, often getting slammed with very blunt rejection. But these forums toughened us up and were great learning pitches for theories and research plans, as as well as, of course, lasting friendships and lots of laughs and mutual support when resilience was necessary. But for me, especially as a termite, you know, biologist, that comparative perspective that sort of incubated on that floor at that time helped me learn so much comparing and contrasting termites and understanding kind of where they fit. And um, in some labs for research, all or most of the students work on some aspects of their professor's study system and research questions. And, And that can be simulating in a very distinct way from what I experienced, which was everybody sharing the same theme of social insects, but in in very different locations and topics and approaches and so forth. So we all felt inspired by being there and learning a lot from each other, as well as watching, like, like at these weekly seminars, to see Ed give comments. And he was always so thoughtful, and he waited until pretty much the end. And then he would give kind of a candid often direct, sometimes harsh assessment, but always ended on a positive note, salvaging something good from from this seminar and watching Ed and Bert Holdobler spar about their differences of opinions and ideas, always cordially and collegially, but very, very direct. I mean, it was just like a phenomenal learning experience. Hmm. So I consider it kind of a golden age of of social insect discourse. Yeah, it sounds like an, uh, just an incredible opportunity. And so I, I hear that for your PhD dissertation, you wanted to understand the evolutionary driver that created the sociality in termites because they're a completely different branch of the insect group than ants and bees and wasps, which are more classically known social insects. And that was the primary goal for your dissertation. So what did Wilson think of that? Right. So um, you're exactly right. So when it came time to pitch my idea for my PhD thesis. I knew that I wanted to combine termites and genetics, which, as I said, was a field that just had amazing, exciting advances at that time, as now, with new tools and discoveries and interpretations and evolutionary theory. So those three, termites, genetics, evolutionary theory. And at least for for me, and I'm sure for you guys, anyone who has kind of found passions in ideas, those interests can be like 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 maybe a piece of art or a song that you love immediately. And when you see that art or you hear that music, even decades later, they still bring genuine happiness. 
That's a similar feeling for me with those three interests, termites, genetics, evolutionary theory. I still find them all capture my curiosity and enthusiasm. So rewinding to, to my dissertation pitch, that's what I told it. I said, I, I want to tackle this huge question. It was very ambitious of, of how did termites evolve, meaning what were the natural selection drivers that favored the evolution of highly social organization in termites, which had to be different, as you've just said, from the ants, bees, and wasps. So <laughs> I can still remember Ed's expression and his reaction about that. And he said, yep, uh, hold on to that, hold on to those goals, but put a pin in it for now and pump the brakes at this early stage of your career. And instead, for your dissertation, you have to focus on a more tractable question or questions. So it's a great plan for your career, but not for your thesis. And he instead recommended uh, having some, some more bite-sized questions that were definitely doable. But he also said, put in some risky things too, some potential gold, some, some things that if they pay off, they'll be wonderful, but you can't count on them for your thesis. So as things played out, that's what I did. I, I went to the tropics, as he recommended, mostly in Central America, studying a, a very widespread, important genus of termites in tropical rainforests and other habitats. And a couple of those species have the very unusual characteristic of having more than one queen in each colony, sometimes multiple kings. So those dynamics, that reproductive dynamic, became the focus of my work. And later in the interview, I think we'll come back to this, but the, this type of termite and their multiple queens has ended up being important in an in, um, invasive species situation that I'm working with in Florida. Hmm. You spent something like 15 years in Wilson's lab, and he obviously had a major impact on your career. You must have some good stories about him and your interactions with him. Uh, do you have some good stories you haven't shared? Oh, I, I appreciate this opportunity because, yes, lot, lots of tributes have been written about Ed Wilson's spectacular scholarly contributions and his prestigious accolades, all deserved, like winning the two Pulitzer Prizes in nonfiction and the U.S. National Medal of Science and, and lots of international honors. But not much has been written about his approaches and his impacts as a mentor. And being in his lab for both my PhD and postdoc and some other aff affiliations, I did have the privilege of getting to know him and work with him closely. And he, as I've said, just full of influential ideas and inspirations and his sense of humor, lightning fast wit, mind always active. He just, he genuinely loved to think. So, um, so yes, I'd love to recount just a couple of things. I, and I'll preface this by saying that at least while I was there, the tradition was to call him Dr. Wilson or Professor Wilson until we successfully defended our PhD dissertation. And then in my case, for example, after my defense meeting, when he shook my hand and congratulations, he said, call me Ed, which was a very hard transition to implement, but also made us freshly minted PhDs very proud and honored. And uh, I always felt he led by example. His ethics and integrity were just impeccable. And his brilliant synthetic mind, he was always integrating things, integrating facts, integrating ideas. He would read very widely economics, philosophy, history. I'd go in to ask him something or other, and he'd pull off a, a book on, you know, some obscure topic, and he was right on it and knew exactly where to look. So again, that broad mind, just phenomenal. On research and scientific topics, he did advise me to work in the tropics. He said it's a profound opportunity, gives you incredible perspective as a biologist, and the graduate student years are a unique time in your life before your life evolves and gets complicated with job commitments and family and so forth. And I followed his advice with that and I, I never regretted it. He said a simple thing, but it turned out to be so important for me, comparative biology. He said, don't just study a single species. Look at two or more species, two or more something or other, because the comparison will always reveal knowledge and interpretations that you might overlook if you're focused only on the single taxon. And he felt that field work was essential. Uh, don't do just everything in the lab. You've got to get out and see these animals in nature. Live with them if possible. And that's why he advocated going to the tropics and living there. He always emphasized the big picture, and he was so good at this, understanding and communicating where your narrow piece of research fit and why it was important. He was always emphasizing that. He had very high standards for clarity and precision of writing. 
So I would submit rough drafts, which I'd already worked on pretty hard, so I thought they were fairly polished. And he'd, he'd mark up the first paragraph as an example of the edits and style he wanted and hand the whole thing back to me and say, revise it. Revise it using that paragraph as a model. Uh, so he was tough, um, but, you know, it just helped you learn so much. So, I mean, I could, I could go on and on, but I do want to fit in one of my very favorite, very personal stories about Ed. This happened in early 1984 and was without doubt the most shocked and temporarily speechless I ever saw him, and it was all due to my actions. It was my first year as a postdoc, and I was in my office, which was remote from the central hallway of the floor, so no one could see into my office when walking down that central corridor. It was a weekend or evening, off hours, hardly anyone was in the building. And Ed almost never came into the student offices, but he must have seen my light on from a distance. And when I looked up from my desk, there he was, this very tall figure in the, in the doorway. And I think he was just about to say hi, but he was so stunned that he looked around in silence for probably all of 30 seconds, but it seemed like an eternity. Just shock on his face. And what he saw in my office that astonished him was at the same time crushing me with regret, and I was imploding with embarrassment that I hadn't asked or informed him about what I'd done. Uh, But the situation was that I'd had a baby a few months before, who I was still nursing, and I was determined how to figure out how to balance being a mom and continuing to work. And I tried to get childcare when I could, and definitely was as courteous as possible about minimizing the baby noise and disruptions and working off hours and so forth. But some infant accessorizing did take place in my office. So I brought in a changing pad and a play mat and a swing where I could park the baby while I worked. And, and well, that, that little office definitely looked a bit like a daycare center, <laughs> and I had never asked him. So there he stood quietly in that doorway, taking in this very unconventional view. And I'm thinking to myself, oh my gosh, you know, why didn't I say something? And we were both just silent. And finally, he looked right at me. He broke the silence by beaming this genuinely enthusiastic smile. And he said, this is great. You do whatever it takes to stay in the game. And honestly, I mean, that meant so much to me then and always. It was very sincere. It was spontaneous. It was supportive. And I have come back to those words infinite times where trying to figure out how to do the big balance, that was helpful. So that's one of my favorite stories about him. It was just he and me, uh, but it was amazing. That's a wonderful story. And in the spirit of bug camp, did you ever visit a National Science Foundation facility called La Selva? It's in Costa Rica. Oh, yes, absolutely. I, I took the Organization for Tropical Studies course that started actually at La Selva. So, yes. In fact, that's where I saw my first live tournament. Have, have you been there? Yes, I spent a few days there. It was a great experience, and it kind of reminded me of your bug camp story. You know, it's a remote location, and the folks that were working there were quite passionate about what they were doing, and they were eager to show me what they were doing and explain what they were doing. Yes, it's a, a stellar atmosphere. These field stations, I hope other disciplines have an equivalent where you can just go big think tank kind of thing where everybody is just jazzed about whatever they're doing, and you learn so much from each other as well as, as, well as focus on what you're doing. So yes, amazing facilities. So Barbara, for your postdoc work, you continued to expand on the work that you did for your dissertation, um, then started dancing in the field of applied termite biology and targeted applications for control because it was right around the time when the silver bullet against termites, chlordane, was pulled from the market. So naturally, people were searching for alternatives. Can you talk about the significance of pulling chlordane from the market and then how this opened up an opportunity for you? Yes. So prior to that, I really honestly did not know how to kill termites. I had no idea about the termite control or really the pest aspect of termite biology. So then, I believe it was in 86 or 87, Chlordane left the market for termite control in the U.S. And it had been pretty much, they almost call it a silver bullet. It really was. It was the one choice that people made that worked very well against termites around a structure. So then the industry was left pretty much without a backup. 
Uh, it was kind of a surprise move that this had happened so quickly. So all of a sudden, and this was kind of at the same time that in other pest management, say ant control, cockroach control, baits were coming on the market, the, the roach motel, this kind of thing, um, and, and rethinking widespread broadcast pesticides for certainly urban pest management. It was a, an idea to be far more targeted, to use the principles that had been used in agriculture and organic farming kind of ideas of, of more integrated pest management, to look for vulnerabilities of the target pest in terms of their life cycle or something you can access and disrupt, and then minimal use of pesticides, very targeted, very specific, to get a, a broad approach to detecting and controlling or containing or preventing the pest. So for termites, what this meant was that the termiticide manufacturers, the chemical manufacturers, were very interested in the biology of the insects because they were trying to come up with these new technologies and new chemistries and new approaches. So people like me happened to be in the right place at the right time of, you know, there weren't too many of us that were trained to know about termites, but not so much about termite pest management. So it was actually fairly exciting to transition into uh, at least understanding that part of termite biology and then the applications and to be able to test some of these new technologies and contribute to their development and to really think about redesigning the whole approach to termite control. That must have been uh, a really interesting evolution. Uh, you, you were well positioned to play a role in that, I guess. Um. I mean, I, I, I did my best. I learned a lot. I, I think we all were eager to help the industry transition, and we saw the promise of some of these new approaches, both for effective pest management, mm -hmm. but also for responsible environmental approaches where you're not putting right. so many pesticides out and, and that kind of thing. Um, so, yes. In the early 90s, you joined the faculty at the University of Maryland. What were some of the primary attractions for you, and can you give us an overview of your research program at Maryland and its significance? We'll talk about details in a minute, but if you could give a sort of high-level overview. Sure. So Maryland, the University of Maryland at College Park is a land-grant institution. And like many, they kind of had a mandate and a tradition, a history of balancing both applied and basic, in, in my case, science. And so in their Department of Entomology, which I joined and was just a, a fantastic group of people and kind of mindsets to balance this both basic and applied. So at some institutions, you have kind of a predominance of one or the other. But at the University of Maryland, it was and still is a very respectful balance and a lot of um, collaboration between the two. So for me, that was perfect because at that point, my research bridged both applied because I continued to work on some of these pest termite species that were the topic of urban and, and structural pest control and these, again, emerging new technologies. And then on the other side, I still had my, my interest in termites, genetics, and evolution that drove me to finally be released to what Ed Wilson had told me to wait for, which was at least exploring these big, big questions of uh, how to termites evolve the very convergent social systems that they have with the ants, bees, and wasps. So at the University of Maryland, which again, I'm so grateful for, for that opportunity and my colleagues there, that's what I did was to bridge those two aspects of research, and it was a good fit for that department. Hmm. STEM Talk is an educational service of the Florida Institute for Human and Machine Cognition, a not-for-profit research organization investigating a broad range of topics aimed at understanding and extending human cognition, locomotion, health span, resilience, and performance. So during your time at Maryland, your most comprehensive research contribution was the hypothesis of accelerated inheritance as a driver for the evolution of eusociality in termites. 
And you followed up on this research in a 2003 paper that ran in PNAS, which is the Scientific Journal for the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. And that paper provided experimental evidence for the powerful selective forces that drive the evolution of eusociality in termites. And that was a question that had perplexed Charles Darwin. And that question is how natural selection could favor traits that reduce reproduction among worker offspring and highly social insects. So Barbara, can you talk a little bit about Darwin's query that remains a, a great debate and also how you approach the topic in termites? Right. So uh, starting with Darwin is great because that's, again, this was sort of summarized in Ed Wilson's book, The Insect Society, is one of the things that intrigued me. And Darwin, who published his book on the origin of species in 1859, actually that manuscript was pretty much done years ahead of that. And one of the reasons that has been put out that perhaps he delayed the publication, although I think there were many reasons, but he was perplexed by the social insects. And he has a little section in his book uh, titled Objections to the Theory of Natural Selection. And he highlights the new, the so-called so neuter and sterile insects. So when you think of a honeybee colony, it's got the queen. The queen is reproducing. But the worker honeybees that go out to get the pollen and the nectar, and they are the nurse bees, and they, you know, build the hive and so forth, they don't reproduce. Sterile. Neuter. That's weird. And especially with evolution by natural selection, where Darwin conceived this, that, gee, they're, they're carrying inherited characteristics that boost survivorship and, and ability to breed more successfully. Those are, the in, those are the animals that will, or organisms, on average, produce more offspring and therefore pass those favorable characteristics on to the next generation. So what's up with not being able to reproduce at all? And so he commented on this, and it was kind of stumped by it. And that debate actually still continues. So the, the traits, the three traits that define the highly social insects, which are all of the living ants, some wasps, some bees, and all of the living termites, and there's some other, other animals too, are overlapping generations. So parents and offspring live concurrently and share the same nest. So the queen honeybee li lives with her offspring. And that's different than most insects, but Overlapping generations, that's one. Second one is called cooperative brood care. So individuals like the honeybee workers within the colony help take care of the eggs and the young. Everybody's pitching in. And then the third characteristic, which is the most unusual, is this reproductive division of labor, where only one or a few individuals dominate the reproduction or ever reproduce. So the queen honeybee, again, she, the workers are performing all the tasks within the hive and forage and so forth. But the queen is the one that's the reproductive, reproductive. And that was a real kicker for Darwin and kind of sense. So um, lots of ideas have been proposed about what favored social evolution. And the theories that tend to fit better with the ants, bees, and wasps, which are a whole different branch of the insects, don't fit as well with the termites. And just to give an example of how the ants, bees, and wasps are very different than the termites, and there was a branch point long ago, and yet they have these convergent, highly social colony lifestyles, which is amazing. The ants, bees, and wasps, which are all very closely related, have complete metamorphosis. So they develop from the egg to the little caterpillar-like like a butterfly, caterpillar, like juvenile, the larvae, then they pupate and they emerge as a very different looking adult. So an immature ant looks very different from the adult ant. But in termites, they're more like um, a grasshopper, say. They have what's called incomplete metamorphosis. So they go from the egg to different stages, but they're successively little mini versions of the adult and ultimately to the final adult form. So that difference in metamorphosis turns out to be very central to this story because termites, as they continue to molt, they can change a long route. They can change to a different form. So in termites, there are different castes. There's workers, there's soldiers, there's reproductives. And at least in the most primitive termites, because they continue to molt, they're not blocked from any of those developmental pathways. Two other important ways that termites differ from ants and bees and wasps are that termites eat cellulose. So that's usually dead plants, decomposing litter, and that's a nutrient-poor diet, not exactly like a power bar of protein. There's not that much protein in cellulose, so their rate of growth and development is slow for termites. 
And also different from ants, bees, and wasps, in termites, the queen and the king live in the colony and survive together and work together. Whereas in honeybees, for example, the queen has one nuptial flight during which time she's inseminated by males. And then those males quickly die while she stores their sperm and produces her family. So back to the termites and me trying to explain this. Termites evolved in, in the late Jurassic, the early Cretaceous, something like 140 million years ago. And there are no solitary termites living now. And without the time machine, we can't go back to look at that transition of what happened between the solitary ancestor to the social to ultimately these highly social species that are all termites now. So I decided that the next best thing is to study living species that have retained a a lot of those ancestral relict characteristics. And this kind of is going back to Ed Wilson's recommendation, comparative biology. Go back, you know, look, and I decided, well, looking at what's living now, but they've retained a lot of ancestral traits. Maybe that'll give some insights, inferences, see what their life was about and what it might have driven, what it might have favored the social living. So we, we my lab, studied mainly essentially the, the dinosaurs of living termites. We picked some that presently live in the very large pine trees, meaning dead, decaying pine trees and logs in Northern California and the Pacific Northwest. So trying to figure out what's going on in the lives of those primitive termites, and the key question is what might have motivated the young ones, the young kind of teenage termites, to hang out at home, stay home, help their parents, be social, rather than attempt to fly off themselves and begin new colonies and their own families, just like most insects do. So what was the driver, the selective force that induced, made it favorable for those young early generation offspring to stay home? And um, spoiler alert, that our, th- our theory that resulted from this research turns out to be remarkably simple, but because termite biology is rather odd, I have to first set the stage. And I do want to thank my collaborators, my lab members, um, Dr. Nancy Breisch, who's a senior research associate at the University of Maryland, and two people who are postdocs in my lab, Dr. Philip Johns, who's now on the faculty of Yale and U.S. College in Singapore, and Dr. Ken Howard, who is a professor at the Sage Colleges in New York, and also several undergraduates who worked on these projects when they were there. I always had undergrads working in my lab. I love that age group. So anyway, just a little bit of background on the, on these primitive dinosaurs of living termites that we studied. Most individuals in primitive termite species, they live their entire life cycle in the same piece of wood, just stuck in there. They don't forage away from their nest, like, say, the termites that infest our homes. That was a much later innovation for termites. So they're, they're stuck in the wood that they are nesting in. And the mature colonies of these termites produce winged swarmers, or males and females, that fly once to disperse and find a mate and start an entirely new colony as a young king and queen. But as you can imagine, those events are quite risky given all of the birds and other predators, as well as environmental hazards like finding enough water in a suitable nest site. So one of the most successful plays for these young flyers is to enter a dead tree or log through a hole in the thick bark, and these are often exit holes for bark beetles in those huge pines. The new king and queen crawl inside into the layer just below the bark, which happens to be soft and reasonably nutrient-rich and they excavate small chambers where they lay eggs and begin their families. So if you can imagine huge tall pines, and you know that the population of bark beetles drill hundreds or even thousands of holes in the trees they attack, you can imagine that as new termite queens and kings enter those holes and begin their colonies, their little families under the bark, it becomes like a big apartment complex. There's lots of neighboring units with a very high density of termite families all under the same piece of bark that they They can't leave. So they're all trapped in there and there's lots of families. And the reality is that as those little families grow and expand right under the bark, they will meet their neighbors. They're going to meet up. And our experiments looked at what happens when these little families meet and the results turned out to be super surprising. In fact, I'll jump right to those punchlines because the results are so, so exciting. And then we'll talk just a little bit more about it. So the two families meet 
And so this is king, queen, plus some workers and soldier too, and the other family as well. And then what happens is that within the first 24 hours, some or all of the parents, meaning the original queens and kings, are killed. Assassination. And then the two families merge and cooperate kind of as a single social unit. And the big news, some of the offspring workers from each of those original families then molt because they are incomplete metamorphosis, so they continue the molt. They molt into replacement reproductives, and therefore they inherit the colony and the nest site and those resources. So this was a big surprise, what happens when two neighboring termite colonies meet, this rapid assassination of kings and queens, and there's not much collateral damage. Sometimes workers or soldiers get taken out, but pretty much it's the reproductives. And after the fighting stops, whoever's left merges and seems to kind of join forces and cooperate. So we called this accelerated inheritance. And why do we call it accelerated? Well, it was, it was well known that primitive termite workers, because of their incomplete development, they do retain the developmental capacity to molt into replacement reproductives if their queen the mother or king the father dies. But it was also well known that termite queens and kings live for a very long time. In fact, termite queens have some of the longest lifespans for all insects. And my lab looked at this for the same species. And we found out that when, you're, when you have these families in isolation, if they don't meet anybody, the queens and kings live an average of four and a half up to seven-ish years, which is pretty long. And, and other types of termites live much longer than that, the queens. But these, it's still many years. So that long lifespan of the parents kind of put a twist into the inheritance idea. If parents are surviving for many years, offspring staying home to help them would have a long wait before they might inherit the throne. So maybe they wouldn't do that. They would just go out and try and found their own colonies. However, by exploring this outcome of meetings between the neighboring colonies under Bark, I think our big discovery was a natural context that causes death of even relatively young parents meaning the young queens and kings, and those, then those opportunities for inheritance by these teenage or young termites who have stayed home and helped their parents, and so instead of fledging from the nest that they were born in and attempting to found their own colonies, which is risky, they have this potential jackpot payoff or evolutionary incentive to stay home and, and either inherit the colony if, if one of their parents dies or have a sibling inherit it. And the probability that their queen or king, their parent, will die even fairly early in this game, while their the broods are young and maturing, is actually fairly high because of the nature of their living situation. So that's why we called our theory accelerated inheritance. And we set this up in the lab with complete families of termites that we had grown, and we knew their relatedness and so forth. But we've also confirmed that this is what happens in, under bark out in nature. And then, so now you have these merged families that are two families together that are larger. And just like in many types of warfare, the bigger team wins. So the, in the next time that they meet a neighboring family, they've got an advantage if they're larger. So it's a reasonably simple core idea that neighbor families meet, the parents are killed, termite offspring inherit. But this happens with unrelated termite families. So it spotlights the ecological context favoring eusocial evolution or highly social evolution in termites rather than a genetic or kin selection basis, which is what had been sort of the anchor theory for the ants, bees, and wasps. Mm. And just one more thing, interestingly, when I presented this idea to Ed Wilson decades after I'd set the goal initially of trying to contribute to understanding of the evolution of termite sociality. Ed told me that he was on board, and in fact, he kind of pivoted some of his thinking for the ants, bees, and wasps. So kind of a long story, but this really is a, a simple idea, and it's been fun to explore. Well, you did a great job telling this story, and to tie it back to Darwin, in the context of termites, it sounds like your experiments sort of addressed the question that had, as you said, stumped him so long ago. Hmm. Um, I hope so. But he kind of also had the very cool 
kernel of the idea that maybe explains for ants, bees, and wasps, and termites, and did enable him to get to the point where he went ahead and published this, his mm. book. Uh, and that was that he, he said, well, they're all families. And that's really kind of a core mm-hmm. element of this, that even if you don't reproduce yourself, if a sibling does, a family does, then that's a win. So, yeah, he, he, we, we would all love to have met Charles Darwin yeah. and to have him know what, what has been discovered since at his inspiration. So you expanded on this research with a study in 2009, and you used genetic markers to demonstrate that in merged colonies, offspring from both original, unrelated families can become new reproductives and even interbreed. So why is that important? Yeah, so that does, is important. So, so if you can imagine these two neighboring but unrelated families under the bark in this big tree, and then they meet, and the reproductives get killed, some or all of them, and then new reproductives develop. We have now shown, and this is where the, those former postdocs who are now faculty members uh, contributed, was that we used genetic markers to show that individuals from both of the families became new reproductives, and even that they interbred so that they, so everybody gets represented or has a chance of being represented in the new generation. So that was exciting. And yeah. then we've also gone out to the field and collected specimens from big natural termite colonies and verified that, yes, they come from multiple original families. So this fusion and carrying on of large social, uh, unrelated social groups in the field does occur. Last year, you put together a TED-Ed video lesson that painted a picture of a conehead termite queen as she begins her reign as one of the longest living insects in the animal kingdom, as you mentioned earlier. It's a fascinating video that shows how a single determined termite braves countless threats to assume the reign and duties of termite royalty, as it were, within a colony. You collaborated with Thomas Johnson Volda on the video, which again is really good and is fun to watch. How did the idea for the video come up and how did you and Volda end up working together? Thank you. Yes, that was super fun. And uh, um, as you guys are expert at with your STEM talk, this communicating with broad audiences is just uh, so important and so such a, such a big part of a scientist's life, or should be. So this actually, it's a four-minute video, and it's animated, and it is fun. It's, it's designed to be learning, but also have a lot of humor, and it, I think they did some very clever things, so I'm quite happy with it. You asked me how I got involved. Actually, Ted Ed came to me and said, we'd love to do a, a termite queen video, and um, they'd already done one on fire ant queens, and wasps, maybe honeybees. I don't know. They sort of have a social insect queen theme going on. And they were super fun to work with. My contribution was giving them a lot of facts and photos and helping to write the script. And then uh, they pulled in the animator, Thomas Johnson Volda and his team, and they got a great narrator. And, you know, it just sort of came together as a lot of fun. Conehead termites were the topic because so Ted Ed was actually going to focus on a different type of termite, and I said, well, you know, conehead termites are pretty hard to beat for queen stories because they are one of the few that has multiple queens. And this, again, goes back full circle career to the termite, the main termite species that I worked on in Central America for my dissertation thesis and have since worked on in South America and most of the Caribbean is the conehead termite, what we now call the conehead termite. And um, so anyway, they, they focused on that, and I think it's a nice video that shows the life cycle of termites and uh, back to the same thing that I mentioned with the primitive termites, the risk of flight. And then in the case of the conehead termite, the advantages of the multiple queens in terms of a very fast reproductive rate Mm -hmm. and their life cycle. So I think, but I give the credit to the TED-Ed team for uh, really pulling that together. We'll put a link to the video in our show notes, and I really encourage our listeners to check it out. It's both educational and entertaining. Thank you. 
So, Barbara, since September 2012, you've served as the science advisor for the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services and are helping them target the invasive conehead termite. And as we discussed earlier, this species was a focus of your PhD dissertation research in Central America. So I understand that you had just retired from your full-time post at Maryland and moved to Florida when you got a call from someone at the state's Department of Agriculture. And evidently, the conehead termite had hitchhiked its way into Florida from the Caribbean. So first, can you tell us a little bit about that phone call? Yes. So, again, a very weird twist. (laughs) Uh, I think it was 2012, and a colleague, a a guy that I had known for many years, who was with the state of Florida's Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, he heard that I had recently moved to Florida, and he called up and he said, we have a situation with this invasive termite, what had become an invasive termite, the same one I had worked on in Central America, uh, snuck into to South Florida, sort of the Fort Lauderdale-ish area, and he was asking if I would help them out. So the control program up to that point had had some twists and turns, and it was at a complicated place. And I, I was reluctant, but I do know that species, and I felt... I have been given so many incredible opportunities and National Science Foundation funding and, you know, like taxpayer supported funding. And this was a tough one because um, because of its history. I'll just leave it at that. But I felt like, OK, no choice. I need to really do all I can to try and stop this termite and, and help with the eradication effort. So I've been full throttle on that since then. So I understand that conehead termites have expansive tastes, and this has caused that's the serious problem in Florida that we're talking about. Can you give people a sense of the damage that conehead termites are causing? Right. So uh, worldwide, there's there's three thousand north of three thousand species of termites in the world, and only a very small proportion of those known termite species are pests. Most of them, in fact probably all of them, including the pest species, are essential for natural ecosystems. They're very swift, efficient, industrious decomposers, so they return nutrients to soils. That's the ecological role of termites. And they also aerate soils. We almost certainly would not have tropical rainforests, or certainly they would look very different than they do now if we did not have termites. Because in tropical rainforests, for example, the soils themselves are very nutrient poor because there's so much biomass tied up in in that lush, verdant growth. And so it's the termites then when those plants or trees or vines or whatever die, the termites are pretty quick at decomposing that cellulose and returning the nutrients to the soil so more plants can grow. But of course, we build out of termite food. You know, we build our homes out of and structures out of wood. So uh, then they become pests. And this is a classic example of that. This, this, uh, what we now call the conehead termite. That's a a common name that the Entomological Society of America has approved for this termite species just because it's kind of catchy and helps us describe it. It does have a scientific name, but I'm not going to get into that. But it's one that is just, it's probably the most broad spread termite, certainly in the New World, probably the whole world. It's um, Central America, South America, much of South America, and most of the Caribbean islands. So it's a very successful termite. But it does have expansive taste, as I, as you said. It eats almost anything made out of cellulose. It'll eat cardboard, it'll eat wood pallets, it eats structures, it eats mango trees, the dead portions of mango trees, avocado trees, natural ecosystems, grasses. So it's a challenge for that reason, because once it gets into a habitat, like, you know, none of us want it, want them eating our homes. But again, we build out of termite food and then the landscape and the parks and the natural ecosystems. And right now we've got a, a population in some mangroves and oh my goodness. So this is going to be a difficult termite if it gets permanently established. We do feel that we have a solid chance at a, uh, eradicating this termite. So that's why we're giving it our best shot. Whereas the the termites that I studied to glean insights into the evolution of termites are near the so-called base of of a diagrammatic evolutionary tree of all termites, these conehead termites are near the apex or the pinnacle. They know pretty much every trip in the termite 
playbook, and they're very agile. They're tough in a lot of ways. <laughs> they repro- they have the multiple queens, so they reproduce very quickly, you know, kind of crazy fast. They can hitchhike. They can hide in wood and travel. They're very capable colonists. But here's the, here's the little hook that we are going to go for. And just as I talked about with learning the applied work, The integrated pest management, what you do is you look for aspects of their biology that maybe you can take advantage of to target the species and control it. So this termite, even though it's very destructive, very challenging in many, many ways, the one advantage that we have trying to find it and trying to control it is that it, unlike every other termite in the U.S., this one lives primarily above ground and it builds extensive, very conspicuous, very visible foraging galleries where they're working 24-7, 365, uh, traveling from their little nest colony to out to find water and find resources. So they're building just extensive gallery networks, which if you know what to look for, they're quite conspicuous. And then as they get a little older, they build a a nest that can get pretty big, like the size of a watermelon or bigger. So the point being that once they, they're, they're like those primitive termites I talked about too, that they, they start with the king and queen, or in this case, multiple queens, multiple kings, hidden within wood. So for those first year, two, three, four, that they're very small colonies, you cannot see them. But then they break out and they're building these foraging galleries and nests, and we can find them. And once we find them, they're a small little termite, and most pesticides will work against them so we can kill them. So that's the game is to have um, had—so when I took this over, we changed everything. We changed pretty much all of the protocols, all of the inspection procedures. We're working with an amazing team of super hardworking, diligent, energetic, smart— Sue and Katie are my field team down in— this this area uh, who are the department uh, the Feder- the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services personnel who are full time um, working on this project and then there are some very smart and supportive administrator leaders in Tallahassee stretching every funding dollar but the state has stepped up to support this it's an attempt to eradicate this really dangerously powerful species. But it is hard to compel funding based on a threat rather than so far it's actually, you know, it's got immense economic, immense, huge economic and environmental destruction potential. But right now we're still relatively early in the invasion curve. So we've made terrific progress. It's eradicated, or at least we have not seen any live termites since 2020 in three cities, three real hotspots that they had been very, very active. So we really knocked them back. There's one pocket persisting that was found in October 2020. So we're now down to about 10 acres of activity of this termite. We do know how to do it. We're optimistic about eradication, but it's, it's, a, it's a fight. Well, I wish you good luck on that. I remember a very similar discussion and even with respect to funding and convincing people to fund the work, when Formosan termites were just yes. coming in and thought to be a future problem. And now, as you know, of course, they're an unbelievable problem. Uh, even a concrete yes. house, they attack the windows. Uh, if there's a porch, you know, I've had several houses with much of the house eaten by these things, as have many friends, you know, and it's, it's, a, it's a significant problem. It's huge. And that's a great example, the Formosan subterranean termite of one that, uh, I don't know if I can put this. So that one, that was a long shot for eradication because they do live underground. You can't tell where the colonies mm-hmm. are. And so not to wave the white flag as soon as they step onto, into the U.S., but pretty much. I mean, that was a tough one to control. This this conehead one is probably equally or even more destructive, believe it or not. But because they build the above ground nests and so forth, we we feel we do have a shot at eradication. But any of these, as you know, the the country has enough termites, so we don't want any more of these no. invaders. And it's a tough go, but that's why I feel so committed to at least trying. In this case, with the conehead termite, you know, with most invasive species, it's 
it's a tough slog because once they start a reproductive population especially, it's very hard to contain, let alone control them. So for most things, like like a Mediterranean fruit fly can fly away or an invasive fish swims away or an invasive Burmese python slithers away or something. Most of them can get away. But with social insects, for most of the year, they're not producing the winged reproductives that will naturally disperse. So we have that working for us also, that if we can stop human transport, which can be a big issue, unfortunately, but we're trying not to have any infested debris transported. That has been a problem in the past. We know that it has been distributed by that mode, and then we have to be on it to inspect those areas and treat so long way of saying, I, I feel your pain with the Formosan subterranean termite, and that's why we're trying really hard to prevent this one from being in the same category. Well, everyone, because once they're out and about, we can't, no. it, you, you lose your single chance to eradicate them. Trust me, everyone in Florida is pulling for you on this one. <laughs> no, well, that's great to hear. Thank there, you. There's no question. The, uh, and I think the analogy to the Formosan, I know it's very different, but the analogy to the relative underappreciation of the threat until it was upon us and, and, and not, not something we could deal with as a state might be useful. Yes, it's so hard because, you know, obviously it, every government agency has so many things on their plate. And in Florida, it's kind of, uh, uh, you know, a first stop for a lot of invasive species. So they have for a lot. Sure. But this one, we actually think is is tractable. We can do this. So that's yeah, like why we it. keep giving a shot. Do, do conehead termites live in Eleuthera? It's a Bahamian uh, out island. Yes. So... You know, I should know that they, they have colonized, I think it's two of the Bahama Islands. I think it's fairly recently, though. I don't know that that's considered part of their native mm-hmm. range. There's something I could look that up and get back to you on it, but I can't okay. tell you off the top of my head. As a child, I lived in Eleuthera for about four years, and there was something that built huge, I think maybe it was an ant colony, but huge black nests. I mean, they were as uh-huh. tall as I was as a child or maybe taller. And, um, of course, children have... Uh, inaccurate sense of scale to some extent. Oh, yeah, but you remember, I trust you. It was pretty tall. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, they're, um, yeah, but I can't tell you exactly on Eleuthera. As you said earlier, you, in a sense, love termites, and as we discussed, Florida's had more than enough of them. And here in downtown Pensacola, where most of IHMC is located, it's a historic district. So the homes were built in the 1800s and early 1900s, and they're made of really strong, dense, high-quality old wood that's, I presume, harder for termites to get into. And understand that you describe the cheap, fast-growing wood that is used today in almost all wooden structures as a kind of candy for termites. And I can see how that would be the case. Do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure that I call every single wood that's used in structures now as candy, but it, you're you're right that certainly the species of wood, the density, the age, the degree of decay, de- degree of moisture, there's so many elements that affect uh, how appealing that is to termites, and, and then, of course, it depends on the species mm-hmm. of termites. But yes, I would say there's a general trend that now we we are all using woods that are softer, and therefore they can, depending on circumstance, be more vulnerable to termite infestation. Yes, uh, even if one knows a wood that would be relatively resistant, like in this area, maybe cypress. The uh, big cypress beams and material like that are now very hard to get and entail long waits. Even five years ago, you could have received these products in a timely basis. And so now you see people substituting less favorable woods, not because of ignorance, but because of lack of availability and the wait time, which messes up the whole construction process. Oh, you're exactly right. And even even now, you know, very topical, timely of, of, of how do you build structures to resist earthquakes, which a lot is known. It's expensive and it's not always implemented, but a lot is known. There's also a lot known about building to prevent termite infestations. But again, and this is a worldwide thing, Australia has investigated this a lot, New Zealand and parts of the U.S., 
but getting, you know, getting that in practice is expensive and difficult. And so it's um, when we get, especially these, you know, you, you said, I, I love termites, which I kind of sort of do, I have to say, <laughs> or maybe respect is more of the, the right word, but I definitely am impressed by termites in their habitat because they are just such important important members of their communities. But I don't want them in my house either. And uh, so it's this fine line of trying to understand um, how we as um, home builders and structure builders can kind of build them out or make them make our structures more resistant to termite infestation. And um, uh, we're not there yet, that's for sure. No, but it that's an important point you just made. We saw that kind of thing happen after serious hurricanes, Andrew, Ivan, and then some of the more subsequent ones. The building code in Florida changed significantly, and there's really nothing analogous uh, for termites, but they do an unbelievable, yes, a very good unbelievable point. amount of damage yeah. in Florida. You know, we really need to get you up here to Pensacola to give an evening lecture at IHMC because there's one subject. No, there are two subjects in Pensacola that everyone dreads uh, but, are, but finds sort of ghoulishly interesting. And one of them is hurricanes and the other are termites. Oh, there we go. And those two intersect. <laughs> so, Well said. We recently had your husband, Ed, on STEM Talk, episode 148. And I met Ed when we were both at NASA and really enjoyed all my interactions with him. We had a good time talking with Ed about his long career at NASA and his experience as the chief scientist for Hubble Space Telescope, as well as his time as associate administrator. And Ed was the one who recommended you to us. And at any rate, I think I understand the two of you listened to Ed's interview together. So what did you think? We did, and I know he and I appreciate the opportunity that you guys took to, to interview him. And, and it was a terrific job. It was just a terrific job of the STEM talk composition, you know, the, the questions, and then, of course, his responses were, were great. But to capture his incredible career and impacts and, and legacy and hear him describe his vision and guidance and the decisions that he made to make things happen with science exploration at NASA it was just wonderful. I, I, loved, I loved listening to the entire thing. And, you know, I think that he recognized the importance not only of communicating science, but seeing science. And that's why he was so careful to make sure that cameras and backup cameras were around so that it could capture with Hubble and now with James Webb and the Mars rovers, these spectacular photos and images that then, you know, for kids, that's what all is about, education mm -hmm. and fostering kids' interests and excitement and making these things accessible to you know, just so many people. So Ed's legacy of impact in not only space exploration, but in science is just going to be legendary. Agree. And he did a terrific job in the interview. And, yeah. and my favorite part was his personality shone through. Hmm. In, in other words, given how well you know him, and, and I know him, of course, not nearly as well, but his personality comes through when you listen to the interview, and it doesn't always happen in interviews. And he, so he did a great job. Well, I think you're right. You, you you caught him. That was very very good. And I I loved that that my two Eds, as I call them, uh, <laughs> Ed Weiler and Ed Wilson, they got to meet, and of course they were immediately absorbed in a fascinating discussion about the prospect of life in the universe, which mm -hmm. both of them are very, you know, like just excited about. So that was super fun for me to have them meet one another. Yes. Uh, my uh, view on that is probably more similar to your first Ed's view. <laughs> uh, if it's intelligent life, I hope not to meet it. But um, <laughs> I remember the Pioneer spacecraft, and it had like a Beatles album on it and a little diagram of a human and uh, a, a map of how to get to Earth if you were smart enough to figure out what the electron spin was on the molecule that was shown. And I'm thinking, okay, if you can grab this spacecraft going 35,000 miles an hour and not destroy it, look it over, somehow play an analog Beatles album, <laughs> and... Uh, look at an electron spin and they figure out where Earth is, I really don't want to meet you. Uh, I can't <laughs> yeah, think of any that. incidents in history when this was good for the more primitive people. So I'm, <laughs> I'd like to pass on meeting them. <laughs> I think you're spot on. 
And just talking about that interview we did with your husband, um, you know, I, I absolutely enjoyed that interview too. And I was just at a NASA human research meeting and I had a number of people pull me aside to tell me how much they, they loved lo- listening to his interview. So uh, oh, hearing that from hear. you know, people who worked with him in the past as well. So um, right. yeah, that was just, that was awesome. I've had the same experience. Yes. Yeah. Oh gosh. Yeah. I'm going to tell him that. He, he, that's, that's wonderful. Yeah. Very, very wonderful. Yep. Well, Barbara, we've really enjoyed chatting with you. And so kind of a final question for you. Now that you and Ed are both retired, what are you guys up to? And we understand the little birdie told us that you particularly enjoy spending time with your grandchildren. Um, you got that wrong. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. I mean, I just feel like every grandmother, I'm so lucky and cherishing every moment. And that's what my kids uh, ended up doing during the pandemic was providing me with with four cutie pies. So mm. um, I want to spend as much time and, and, you know, foster all of their exciting interests and curiosity and everything. So, yeah, that's a high priority for me. Grandkids are amazing because they're so good for the grandparent, and yet grandparent is so good for them. It's a wonderful thing. Well, that's a, that's a great way to look at it, and I agree with you. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. We really enjoyed speaking with you today, Barbara. Well, thanks very, very much for uh, to all of you. It was it was fun for me, and I really appreciate all the time you put into this to prepare. Thank you, Barbara. It was wonderful. Stem talk. Stem talk. Stem talk. Stem talk. Stem talk. Stem talk. Well, first of all, I love the name Conehead Turnmite. I know that's a, a funny comment to start off with, but just thinking of SNL. And second, I had no idea that Coneheads were so interesting, and I hope all of our listeners were as fascinated by Barbara's knowledge of termites as we were. And for you listeners who have not had a chance to view Barbara's animated Ted Ed cartoon on the Conehead Termite, you definitely have to head to our show notes right now and check it out. It is quite entertaining and very well done. Yes, Don, this was a fascinating interview about a subject that most people don't spend a lot of time thinking about, unless, as I have, a large portion of your house has been devoured by these things. <laughs> as we discussed in the interview, termites are a very big deal in parts of the United States, particularly Florida, and we have way more than enough of them. And just as a side note, I think it's awesome to hear about her experience training with E.O. Wilson. What an incredible opportunity. Yeah, an amazing scientist. Yes. So if you enjoyed this interview as much as Ken and I did, we invite you to visit the Semtalk webpage where you can find the show notes for this and other episodes at semtalk.us. This is Don Cornega signing off for now. And this is Ken Ford saying goodbye until we meet again on STEM Talk. Thank you for listening to STEM Talk. We want this podcast to be discovered by others. So please take a minute to go to iTunes to rate the podcast and perhaps even write a review. More information about this and other episodes can be found at our website, stemtalk.us. There, you can also find more information about the guests we interview.